Okay, so it's practical the last couple weeks. Well, tonight we're going to get very practical, and I'm going to give you a tool that, um, for those of you who have gone to my church, it's a tool you've probably seen me talk about before, um, but this is a tool that we're going to utilize tonight, which is indispensable, I think, for biblical study. It's one that I use every week in preparation for, for preaching and for teaching, and it's verse pooling. And so if you don't have, this is why I really recommend you get a study Bible before we get, so the, the best tool you have with a study Bible, how many of you have a study Bible here? Oh, good. So this will be, this will be fun. NIV study Bible? NIV study Bible, Sarah? All right. Um, so you guys, if you want to go ahead and open up that study Bible, it, you don't have to have one tonight. I could still direct you, but it, it'd be much more fruitful if you, if you possessed a study Bible. So uh, take a look at this. So in your study Bible, so if I open up to any passage here, you can see this is Matthew 6, which is where we're going to go tonight. You see the red letters, and there's a middle portion in this key right here, or the page. There's a middle key. Do you see that right there? When you read the text, so if I'm reading the text right here, there'll be little um, alphabetical, there'll be letters that correspond to another text on the same topic in another place in the Bible. So, um, so tonight we're going to do worry or anxiety. We're, we're going to do that tonight. And the point of verse pooling is, the point of verse pooling, you guys, is, is so that you don't, is so that you don't uh, take a verse, lift it up out of context, and then make that one verse like, the, the king of how you look at a particular topic, because how, I don't know how many verses we could look at where the Bible speaks of worry, but you'd probably be in the triple digits. And so what you want to do is you want to build, you want to build uh, a pool of verses which says, okay, this is what God says about worry here. Here's what he says here. Here's what he says here. And it's many times, it's, it's like a diamond, you know, it, it, it's like a prism where you could look at it from, from different angles, right? And so it gives you a more holistic picture of what God has to say rather than one isolated picture. To be sure, you could use isolated verses, but you're not going to get that breadth and that width of what God is really after on these topics unless you could build a pool or a big coalition of verses. So many times, even if you don't want to even verse pool with a topic, you could use this methodology to just uh, what I call Bible surf. So it might not be on topic. You could go to, the, you see a letter there in, in the passage that you're reading, takes you to the book of Colossians. You see something in Colossians, bang, takes you to Psalm 121. Psalm 121, oh, but now we're, now we're in Genesis 12, and now we're back into 2 Samuel. And so you'll, you could just surf around. The reason I like doing it with a Bible rather than with a phone, phone's fine, but I, the reason I like using a Bible is because as you pool and as you search, you're also you're also learning to navigate a really big book. So you're, oh, that's where Esther is. <laughs> you know, oh, Hosea, where, where is he now? Oh, Zechariah. So you could, you, you could begin to navigate where, where books of the Bible are. You see, you see what I'm saying? So that's a very, 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 very import, important tool. So if you don't have a study Bible, that's fine. But what we're going to do is, and, and let me tell you what I've done when I verse pool. I do it every week depending upon the topic or just if I wanted to spend time with the Lord. So spending time with the Lord, uh, I had a buddy in college who, you've heard me say this before, I'd say, hey, bro, do you want to go, you know, go to the ball game or catch a movie or something? And he says, not tonight, I'm going to go spend time with the Lord. And I was like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> How do you spend time with the Lord? And he would just, he would just get in the word and then read a verse, pray over the verse, silence, you know, let the Holy Spirit guide you, read a verse, pray over the verse. And he would also just surf scripture and, and, and he would verse pool like this. And that's, it's more for the relationship than it is for the head. So it's, it's more not gnosis, which the Greek word gnosis is knowledge, right? That's like two plus two equals four. It's more for here than it is for here. So it's more for your relationship, which is where most typically Christians who are sitting in a university on a Tuesday night care a lot about this, right? And this is a little bit deficient probably. But like I always say, I've seen a lot of people with this who don't have this, 
but I've never seen someone who has this who doesn't have this. See what I'm saying? So the epigenosis, that's the overknowledge in the Greek. So there's gnosis, which is facts, and there's epigenosis, which is it's overknowledge, which means um, you're knowing God's heart rather than just do this, don't do that, believe this, don't believe that, which both are, both are, both are vital. But if God's got the heart, I look, think about it, this may not make sense until you think about it relationally. So like, you know, when I, when I, my wife and I were dating and we were in love and we had a pretty swift courtship, which, you know, I got back from the war in Iraq and then, you know, I was, I was married nine months later. So that's pretty swift. We met, <laughs> you know, but during those nine months is, is that I want, you know, I knew she was a dancer. I knew she was beautiful. I knew all the different, I knew where she went to school. We went to high school together, where she went to college, about her family. But what I really was after, you know, in these nine months, think about your own courtships, right? You're really after, excuse me. She has my heart. She has, she has the epigenosis, the overknowledge, the relational knowledge. She has that. But because she had that, I want to know everything about her because of that. You know, I, I, I want to know your favorite color. I want to know what you, you know, what do you, do you like Mexican food? What do you like? What do you, uh, what are your dreams? What are your aspirations? I want to know that. I want to know that the gnosis because she already has the gnosis. She already has my heart. And so if you don't, it's a little bit of an accusatory statement I'm going to make. If God does not know, if God does not have your heart, none of this matters right? Because Jesus encountered a lot of people. You praise me with your mouth, like you know how to do the prayers, you know how to speak correctly. The, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes knew the Bible better than anyone, knew it better than Jesus' disciples, but he didn't have their heart. What would he say about them? He called them whitewashed tombs, right? What does that mean? It's you, you, you're, you're a very beautifully decorated, uh, knowledgeable, ornate tomb, but inside of you is just dead stuff, you see? And I think that's where a lot of people fall short is, and I'm going to spend some time with the Lord, and I'm going I'm to I'm have him grow, grow the relationship. And like I said, if God gets this, undoubtedly he's going to get this. St. Anselm. How many of you heard of a man named St. Ans Anselm, 12th century? Wrote a famous Christian thesis that you all need to read before you die, Cur Deus Homo, Why God Became Man. He also had in his Prologion uh, what's called the ontological argument for the existence of God. He was brilliant beyond belief. My teacher at seminary, Walter Sundberg, history professor, said Anselm, it's a weird name, but Anselm was brilliant on a level that defies definition almost. I mean, you've seen people that you're like, this guy or gal is just beyond brilliant. He says he was a Rolls Royce. And I said, well, he goes, here's what I mean by a Rolls Royce. Like the average car has like whatever, four quarts of oil. A Rolls Royce has 12 quarts of oil. So literally there's oil just bathing every nook and cranny of a Rolls Royce. It's the queen of vehicles, right? And he says, Anselm was a Rolls Royce in terms of his intellect. He says, but he drove the speed limit. <laughs> right? He wanted to stay in the confines of what faithful research and teaching looked like to, the, to, to his God. Anselm had a statement, fides quorns intellectum. Anyone have an idea of what that means? You could kind of get a little English out of that. Fides quorns intellectum. He's going to Google it. Um, Faith, that is the epikinosis, faith, trust. And when we say faith in the Bible, what is, what is the Bible really saying? Faith, not cognition of belief, not gnosis necessarily. It involves that, but when the Bible says faith, it means more trust in our English language. Trust. Like Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your strength and all your might and lean not on your own understanding. That's not talking to an intellect right there, is it? Trust in the Lord with all your strength, all your might, and lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. That's epigenosis. Um, the Apostle Paul prays for the community in Ephesus. How He says, you may grow more and more in the knowledge of his grace. 
and he's praying to people who are al- he's writing to people who are already Christian. So what is he saying? He's praying that people who already know the Lord will seek seek to know him more in this epigenosis way. Faith seeks understanding. Faith wants to, it's the language of the relationship, the language of love. Fides quorum's intellectum. Faith seeks understanding. It makes sense relationally, does it? It wants to know more. So God is after this first. God is after this first. And after this is acquired, gosh, that's where people really go on fire to know more about him, to know doctrine, to study, Trinitar- to su- study systematic theology and study church history and study the historical reliability of the Bible. And that, see, people that, whose hearts, hearts are captured will do that. People that don't have their hearts captured won't do that. And then will make excuses about, well, the Bible is too this, and the Bible, uh, it's a big book, and I just, I didn't, ha- I didn't have time today, or here's my favorite, I- I've been really busy, right? <laughs> I always hate to hear that. That really irritates me when I hear that. I've been really busy, because you make time for what's important. And that's just, that's, that's, that's base, basic 101 pedagogy to an eight-year-old, <laughs> right? This is an advanced systematic theology. You make time for what is important to you, you don't make time for what's not important to you. And if he's important to you, the epigenosis, you're going to make time for him. If he's not important to you, you don't make time for him. So that's one of the ways you could gauge, like, am I hungering to get into prayer with, with the Lord? Am I hungering to get into his word? Gerhard Ferdi, my teacher, always used to say, also, do you have a hunger for the sacrament? Do you want to take the Lord's Supper? You know, the presence of Christ, do you hunger for that? Do you want to just run down the aisle and, and, and grab hold of that. You know, that's, that's epigenosis. You see it all throughout the New Testament. Um, John Wheeler and I have been studying the last couple of weeks uh, Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany was the one who, uh, right before Jesus' death, remember, anointed his, uh, bo- his feet and his, his body with expensive, expensive ointment, or not perfume, because that I feel demasculinized when you say perfume, but like... <laughs> Ex- exp- expensive oil, you know, um, probably like number of years worth of wages type of expenses for someone who is not economically, as you could, as you could say, on top. And what is that? That's epigenosis. She's pouring everything she has into him, pouring everything. That's, that's, what, the, that's what the Lord's after. And you remember who objected to, to Mary of Bethany's offering? Yeah, it was Judas. And you remember what his, his line was? Well, we could have given this to the poor, right? We could have saved the environment with this. And, uh, uh, and, and, and Jesus says, I love it because it's one of the times he's most ostensibly stern with his disciples. He says to them, leave her alone. I love that. He says, she has anointed me for my burial. And then he has this wonderful phrase in Mark 14. He says, where he says, Wherever the gospel is proclaimed, her name will be remembered. That's a pretty big statement. That's a really big statement. Because all, the 12 dum-dums didn't even know that he was going to die and to rise again, right? And he says, Mary knew it. Because he said, she anointed me for my burial. And wherever the gospel is preached, her name is going to be known. That's a really, really big put-up for Mary of Bethany, all based upon what? Epigenosis. Epigenosis. Um, and so, here, just do a temperature check on your hunger for the Word, on your hunger for prayer, on your hunger uh, to hear the Word. You know that old story I, I always like to tell where that guy I used to visit, and he'd grieve over his daughter, and he would, his daughter was dead, and he, he, he hungered for the Word. There's epigenosis. And this is a strict, old, uh, crotchety, salty, uh, ex-Norwegian ex-farmer. Can you imagine like the, a more stoic, a more stoic figure than that? Gosh, you know, no, Norwegians usually aren't comfortable unless they're around a graveyard for crying out loud. You know, I mean, uh, they, 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 they love their misery, so to speak, which is why when they settled in the United States, they stopped in Minnesota and North Dakota and South Dakota, Right? <laughs> Why the hell would you stop there? Yeah. <laughs> he used to say to me, old Spencer, 
he used to, he'd say, he'd grieve over his daughter, and he'd say, Pastor Shaw, say it to me. Say it to me. You know, he wanted to hear, Christ is risen. So is your daughter. You will be too. See, that, what was that a hunger for? See, this thing, he already knew that, right? He already had faith, but why did he need to hear it? You see, don't ever ask your spouse that, right? Uh, do you love me? Well, I told you that 10 years ago. Uh, <laughs> Why? Because true relationship, true love needs to hear it again and again and again and again. The psychological literature is even out on this about parents, how they speak with their children and say, I love you to your children. I mean, the the, the literature is not even debatable. They need to hear that. They need that compassion. They need those words from their parents or the the heart starts to grow cold and, 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 and stale. And so how much more, this is why the Apostle Paul says, how does faith, how is faith nourished and created and sustained? How is it? By hearing. You got to hear it. You got to hear the gospel. And Spencer um, had that epigenosis and he craved to hear the voice of his, of his Savior. Because hmm? when you speak the gospel, you always got to remember, you're not speaking the word of Dan or the word of Marv. You're, when you speak the gospel, you're speaking the, the, you're asking people to say, do you believe the words I say to you comes from Jesus Christ himself? That's actually in the little rubric in the Lutheran Church for confession, when you confess your sin. And uh, funny enough, I had a guy come and ask me this Sunday, do you hear confession? I said, well, you could do it with me, I says, uh, which is great, because I know what to do with it. Um, but I said, if you don't do it with me, you're going to do it with someone. You're going to do it with a friend. You're going to do it with a barber. You're going to do it with a, a bartender, or a, a, your, your, your mailman. You're going to do it with someone. People are going to confess, but you got to know what to do with it you know? And one of the lines in the hymnal, it says, before you pronounce the gospel over someone, you say this, do you believe the words that I speak to you come from Christ himself? You remember in the old absolution in the Lutheran church, it used to say, as a called and ordained minister of the church of Christ and by his authority, you see, his authority, this is coming from God himself, I declare unto you in Jesus' name, the forgiveness of all your sin, you know? See, that's, that's the gospel, and so people need to, faith comes by hearing. You have to hear that. You have to speak it to one another. Well, enough uh, waggling on the T. Let's, uh, let's hop in to Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to show you how to verse pool. So one of the things I didn't tell you was what I do every week is I get a notepad and uh, I'm, I write out on a notepad everything that we're going to do tonight for the next half hour. And, and then I take it and I file it. And it's a hard copy. And so whenever I'm wondering, what what does the Lord think about forgiveness? And I've already verse pooled it to a great degree. You could verse pool for hours. And then I pull that sheet out and I remind myself, oh, oh, that's right, that's right. Or about um, prayer, bang, this is what the Lord, we're commanded, that's right, look at all these verses. And so you you could pull them out and use them on yourself, right? In essence, start to preach to yourself, which, which you should be doing anyway. (laughs) <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but David does this all the time in the Psalms. Why are you downcast, O my soul? <laughs> right? And why are you disquieted? Well, who's he talking to? He's talking to himself. He says, trust in the Lord, hope in the Lord. He's preaching to himself. That's why you got to learn to preach to yourself. Okay, here we go. So let's start in Matthew 6.25. And we're going to look at anxiety and worry. Right? Because what are people always... This is W.H. Auden, the great British poet. Remember what he, he wrote a, a treatise called We Live in the Age of Anxiety? <laughs> right? This is the most... I bet if you talk to any... We have a number of uh, therapists, psychologists in our church. I bet if you went and asked them what's the most common thing you're treating, it's either probably this or depression. That's probably 90 plus percent of their work is this or depression or some sort of anxiety or depression that was based upon some level of trauma, right? So this is a crucial, crucial thing to begin to look at. And so our first passage, look, so let's take that, erase that. So we're in anxiety and worry. And what I do is I, I, I underline this and then I draw an arrow. And our first passage is Matthew 6, right? 25 to 35, I got to write smaller because we're going to be really rocking around here. So we all there, Matthew 6, 25 to 35. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry 
Now I have a little letter next to worry right there. Do you, do you guys see that, those who have the NIV study Bible? I do. I have, a, I have the letter F. We'll come back to that. But let's parse out this passage about worry first. Jesus says about your life, what you will eat or what you would drink, about your body or what you will wear. Okay. What's the first thing you learn about anxiety and worry? What's the first thing, gang? <laughs> it's it's future-oriented. Is it not? You can see it right there. Don't worry about what you will, what you will, what you will. And he's not talking about necessarily about food and clothes, although here he is, because food and clothes for them was more of an existential issue than it is for us. If you ask my kids where food comes from, they'd say Safeway. So not the case back then. Like food was a major issue, which is why taking a Sabbath and you devote it to the Lord and not working was a real sacrifice because you might not know where your next meal is going to come from. And so you're really worshiping God on faith now because if you're not working, you're risking not having food. So that's why Sabbath is a faith act to devote yourself to God and not just a day where you could sleep in and watch the NFL. It's future oriented. So think about what would the modern day, what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear, whatever that is. You know, fill in the blank on whatever it is that modern humanity ha- version of drink, wear, eat. And it's some sort of existential thing where you say, I have to have that, right? If I don't have this, my life is in danger. If I don't get this, uh, my dreams and my hopes are gonna fall, I'm, my dreams and my hopes are gonna get extinguished. And what would that be? Oh gosh, it could be anything, right? I mean, that could be relationships, it could be career, it could be your schooling, um, it could be your career, your job, uh, most notably now it's probably relationships, and here's Jesus, fill in the blank, future, anxiety is always future oriented, and why is this an affront to God most of the time, future oriented, anxiety? Because you're, you're not trusting the one who holds the future, correct, right? So. Just know that worry is a form of unfaith. So it's not like, oh, don't worry. <laughs> that, no, it's a serious stinking issue. But Jesus is going to give you a reason not to worry. Not, not, like, not like your friends who would just say, well, don't worry about it. And you'd be like, you don't want to punch someone in the face when they say that. Like, you're giving me a prescription without any foundation for the, the cure. What do you, how do you just not worry? You know, what, you know what you just made me do by telling me not to worry, Jesus? Now I'm really worrying. <laughs> because you got me thinking about worrying. And now I'm worrying. Ha! Now watch, you really, get your t- you really take a bite out of your own butt like a dog chasing its tail. You start to worry, huh? And then you think, no, I'm a Christian. And I shouldn't be worrying. And what are you doing? You're worrying about your worrying. And then you think, oh gosh, I'm now I'm worrying about, am, 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 am I, and you start to worry about worrying about worrying. And this is what happens in the cycle of the self. This is what sin does, you guys. It gets you stuck in yourself, in the endless cycle of chasing yourself, which is the essence of sin, right? Instead of chasing after him, instead of trusting in his words, you trust, you start chasing yourself. You start chasing your desires. You know, and it, it, this can happen in a variety of venues. With me, when I was young, it was football. It was sports. And uh, sports, as you know, you're, many of you have played sports. Your kids have played sports at a very high level. Um, football, baseball, th- these, are, these are not grace-filled occupations. They, they don't forgive you. <laughs> if you're not hitting, what, Jerry? Yeah, you're worried if you're not hitting, right? If you're not performing, you're in trouble. Go, go ask your husband about, <laughs> Sari's husband coaches at PLU. It's like, hey, we're gracious and we're loving, but if you're not performing, you're going to be standing next to Coach Kime on the sidelines, right? And so it, when you invest your heart into something that can't absolve you and can't love you and is only contingent to love you as long as you perform, you're going to get busted up sooner or later. This is why old athletes are some of the most, you know, myself, I consider myself included, some of the most, you know, powerful figures to look at. It's because the, 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 I once was a, <laughs> I used to be, you know, look at my clippings, that sort of stuff. So it's future-oriented. What else do we learn? I hope this is helpful. Um, 
because I feel like I'm preaching to myself here too. Um, look at verse 26. Jesus says, uh, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or st- store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you much more valuable than they? Who by worrying could add a single, single hour to your life? Um, worrying, look at, Jesus says, look at how God provides. See what he does? Worrying does not, won't look at God's provision. Won't look at God's goodness. Specifically here, it's provision, right? But it won't look at that. Why? Because worry is constantly looking at what? Itself and at the future and, and the uncertainty of the future. Which is sin. Why? Athena, why? Be- Instead of trusting him, yeah. Like God's got the future. And, and Jesus says, the problem with worry is that you're worrying about the future in the present. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and Jesus' point is, and, and what could you do about that right now? What, what is your worrying adding to this relationship? What is your worrying adding to this job? Is it adding anything? No, it's detracting. Yes, ma'am. Correct. Correct. Well, Jesus says that. Can you add an even another hour to your life? Um, look at verse, uh, verse 30. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now you learn another characteristic of worry, which we've alluded to. When he's saying, you of little faith, he's not saying, oh, you just have a little bit. He's saying, you who don't have any. <laughs> It's a slap. It's not a like a, oh, isn't your little faith cute? Look at your little faith. It's just like a little puppy. It's cute. There are many times where he is saying that, like little faith could do great things, like the mustard seed. But here he's not. This is a chiding remark. Oh, you have little faith. Worry has little faith. Let's finish up this passage. Um, Verse 32. For the pagans run after these things. Jesus says, when you worry, look at, what does he mean by the pagans run after these things? He says, when you're worrying and freaking out, you look like the people who don't even believe in God. You look like an atheist because they don't have a future. Their future is the dirt and the worms. And yes, if that's your future and this life is all there is, you damn well better worry a lot because this is all, this is all you're going to get for life and you better make the most of it right? He says, when Christians do this, you look like them. That's a bad indictment, isn't it? And then what does he say? Look at, G- look at what Jesus says. For the pagans run after the verse 32, and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Because I love, I love that passage. Look at, he gives you a foundation for not worrying. God knows. God provides. Look at, God knows. God provides. It's like I always like to give that example if some of you are in a state of uh, anxiety or worry and if, if the archangel Gabriel came right down from heaven and said, I just left God and he wanted me to tell you, Lori, he knows. Wouldn't you just go, oh, he knows. Well, that's what you're getting right now. You're getting, but better than an angel. You're getting it from God himself. Way better than an angel. God knows. He knows. So he's not saying don't worry and that's it. (laughs) He's saying, don't worry because God provides, God knows, God loves, God cares. See what Jesus is doing? He's trying here to get us who are worrying from staring, Luther called it navel gazing. What's your navel? You know, what's that? That's the way he said, staring at yourself. You're just navel gazing. And so when you're gazing at your navel, when you're looking down at yourself, it's kind of hard to see something that's above you. So what Jesus Christ is trying to do is trying to get you off of your own gross, you know, lint-filled navel and, and, lift your head, and lift your head up so you could see him. That's what he's trying to do. Clear in the passage, isn't it? But look at verse 33. It says, but seek, what's that word there? Seek what? 
first. There it is. So you have the foundation of who God is, where your eyes should be, and then he's saying, and here's what you're supposed to do with your worry. Not just say, okay, I'm resolved. I'm not going to do it because God knows, which is true. But he says, I'm going to give you some homework. Seek first. What does that mean? Not your boyfriend, not your grades, not your degree, not your wife, not your husband, not your IR, yeah, not, not, your, not your pension, not your paycheck. He says, those aren't bad things. Seek God's kingdom first. And then he says, and his righteousness. Do you see that? What does he mean by that? Don't seek your own righteousness. <laughs> Well, what do we do when we want the perfect love partner and we want to be successful in career? What are we trying to seek for ourselves? A righteousness. That word righteousness, dikaiosuni, is the direct corollary to the Greek word for justification, to be justified, to be made right, huh? You want to be made right. You want to be righteous. You want to seek your own justification. You want to save yourself. Give meaning to yourself. And Jesus says, seek his righteousness first. Seek that first, the righteousness that comes from the cross, the righteousness that comes from the blood, the righteousness that comes only from Jesus. Seek his righteousness first. This is Luther. Luther, in in, uh, Romans 3, he he said, I hated that phrase, the righteousness of God. Hated it. Do you know why? Because he thought it was a righteousness of God that he had to attain to. And then he says, "The, the, the floodgates opened for him. He goes, and I entered through the gates of paradise anew, Luther says, in his, in his preface to the New Testament, which is just a glorious preface, where he said, the righteousness of God is not something that I'm to attain and to achieve. It's a righteousness that he gives me through faith in Jesus Christ. It's a, it's, you could be righteous, it's just not your righteousness. <laughs> it comes from another. It comes from someone else. It comes from him. Seek first that righteousness. Are you, and so we say, well, how do I know if I'm not seeking that first? Here, I'll give you a little uh, trick. Uh, not a trick, but a, a method that I've used before. Um, track your emotions. What do you get emotional over, right? Like I remember when I was, when I was coaching football in my early years, I, I was prone to uh, anger. And I'm not like an angry person, you know, unless I'm around idiots. But like... Um, uh, Self-righteous idiots, let's put it that way. Um, and then I, I remember thinking to myself, why am I so angry? Like I used to struggle with it coaching. Part of it is I can't be out there. Um, but why did it generate extreme emotion? See, that's different. It's one thing to, to be concerned and to have attention onto something. It's another to exhibit like flares of emotion where you just get angry like that. That's not normal. Where's that coming from? Or extreme uh, uh, sorrow and sadness, like if someone, someone breaks up with you and it just it throws you into the dark for like a month and you just can't stop crying or a loved one passes away and you just can't, don't know how you're going to go on and you can't stop crying and you just weep and you weep and you wail. That's extreme emotion, right? That's, the reason I say it's extreme is that shouldn't happen every day and it doesn't, so it's extreme. Where does that come from? It's coming from somewhere. That's why I always say, track your, pay attention to your, where you get really emotional over stuff, and that will breadcrumb you back to where you're putting something first above his kingdom. Because look at it this way. Um, I don't get super concerned or emotional with, um, uh, let's put it, uh, with Marv's finances. I care about Marv and I love Marv, but I'm not going to lose sleep and weep and scream over Marv's finances, right? But if Kim and I, with, but with, but with Kim and I and our three boys, if we lost all the money, all of our money, and can't, and our kids are in the hospital, and we can't afford, you're going to see extreme emotion come out of me. Why is that? Because it's really important. It's more important than his to my heart. And so when you see the extreme emotion, you're starting to breadcrumb as to what's really going on in your heart. Is it control? Is it, uh, is it, pro- is it, is it, is it pride? Is it power? Is it, is it prestige? Is it comfort? Those things will start to surface to get to the origin of this, to get to the origin of your, your, your worry. 
I mean, think about that. I'm, I'm really anxious about this. We have to take this trip, and I have this test coming up next week, and we got this dance, and I don't know if I'm, she likes this other guy. And I'm, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. Stop talking. I think I'm going to cry right now. That stuff. Where's that coming from? Because Jesus is saying right here, if it doesn't come from God, then where does it come from? And if it's not from God, it's not from someplace that's very good. I have to have her, and, or I'll die. I don't know what I'll do. Where does that come from? I mean, we like to talk about Romeo and Juliet. Whoa, yeah. I mean, you're so in love and you're so uh, infatuated that you kill yourself if the other one dies. That's not normal. I know we look at the Shakespeare and say, oh, look at they would rather die than not have their love for one another. That's insane, horrific sin. It's not a, oh, isn't that cute? It's horrible, grotesque. So I hate that play. Um, <laughs> seek first his kingdom. And well, how do you do this? It's kind of what we're doing now. Um, here, I'll give you. Take your worry. So we all have minor or major worries here tonight. Look at what your king has done for you. Look at how he came at infinite length and at infinite cost with the spilling of his blood to have you and to give you a, a life to the full, life, life to the fullest, Jesus says in John 10, 10, the abundant life. And he's willing to just go to whatever lengths to go into the, 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 the pit of hell in order so, and to go into the darkness so you never have to. Don't you love that man? Isn't that, what, what do you have to worry about now? Don't you want him first in your heart? See, see what happens there? Um, verse 34, look at Jesus says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. So in other words, he's re reiterating future oriented. Okay, back to my footnote. Let's, we got 10 minutes. Um, that's the problem with taking weighty passages in scripture. You could spend literally 80 hours on this passage. You, and some people say, well, the Bible's a simple, dumb book full of fairy tales. It's like, really? <laughs> Let's see you master that thing and look at that, that cross-referencing graphic I gave you guys at the, the first week. Over 65,000 cross-references. You think you could figure that thing out? Good luck. So the, my, F, <laughs> my F letter says to go over to Luke chapter 10. And so what I do is I take... So I have Matthew 6 circled, that's one. Then I go to Luke 10, it says Luke 10, 38 to 42. That's the next passage where this, this passage, now look it, has jumped me to Luke. See what I'm saying? So we're going to get another passage about worry. So let's, now we're going to now we're gonna go to Luke. Well, you, wi you will, it just, it just, you will have different letters, it just depends on what your translation is and what year it was translated. But in essence, it's just roll with me on this. So Luke 10, 38 to 42. Look at, I'll read it. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he said. Who, by the way, not meaning to backtrack, which Mary is that? It's the Mary we were talking about. This is Mary of Bethany. And notice what Mary does. What does she do? She sits at the Lord's feet and listens to him. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is necessary or needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will be not, not be taken away from her. What do we learn about worry here? Jesus says, um, Worried and upset, and then you have up in verse 40, it says she was distracted. So, worry, the Greek word distracted there, I looked it up before I came over, you guys, means to be uh, pulled, feel, because you're, you're pulled to pieces because you're pulled in so many different directions. You ever felt like that when, I got, I got so much to do, I'm so busy, I don't know how I'm going to get it in. This is another facet, you're, you're pulled apart. You, you, you're, you're, it's almost like a, 
you feel like you're disintegrating. You're just pulled in so many. Go talk to my wife. This is, this is what Kim deals with because, well, I do too, but like at our house, there's, you know, it's like the mail. The laundry never ends. It just keeps coming every day, the laundry. And it, it, uh, it's just, there's a mountain and, and our kids are ones that like wear a sweatshirt once and throw it in the dirty clothes. It's like, no, put that damn thing on for four more days before that sweatshirt goes in the dirty clothes. And then their so, kids are so weird, they'll wear like the same underwear or socks for three days, but take a sweatshirt on one day and throw it in the water. I mean, you're worried and dist- And then what does Jesus say to her? Look at verse, uh, look at, he, he says, verse 41, Martha, Martha, um, Jesus never uses a doubling unless it's super intense in a name. He, listen to this, he hardly ever does it without crying. In the Old Testament, too, it's like that. David, Absalom, Absalom, Martha, Martha, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Simon, Simon, Jesus says. It's always extreme, so this worry thing is not a minor thing. This is a serious, serious spiritual cancer that Jesus is talking about. So he doubles doubles her name, Martha, Martha. You're worried, upset about many things, right? Distracted, pulled apart, many things. Furthermore, what are Martha's first words? What does she say? Can someone tell me? No, she talks to Jesus. So give me it verbatim. Ah, Lord, do you not care? Hmm. That's a weird thing to say to the Son of God who's the Savior of the world who's going to bleed out and go to hell for you to save us and give us life. That's a weird thing to ask. Do you not care? What are we back to, guys? Look at Worry makes you question God's goodness. Do you not care? That's an amazing, that's an amazing statement to say to him. By the way, side note, while she's working to serve him. So what does that tell you? Wow, you have all these jobs in the church and you have all these uh, titles and you have all these things that you do for God and you do for God and you read these and you say these prayers and you say these blah, 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 blah. And her heart's far from him. Isn't that wild? Wow, you could confess that creed, you could sing that song. You could say that prayer, and worry gets you to question. And, and you, could, you could berate God while you serve him. That's insane. But that's, here's my favorite quote about sin, because I'm the expert on sin. Um, that should be, re- that, that's a joke. You're like, uh, we're all experts on sin is my point. Um, sin, heart that's far from God. Here's my quote, and it's on my desk at church. Sin makes you stupid. It does. It's, it's, it's how you ever see in the news, like how could, how could that guy, he had everything going for him. He was, you know, an all-star ball player and, or this pastor, he was doing such a great job. How could he, how could he, how could he have an affair? How could he cheat on his wife? How could he solicit a prostitute? How could that person steal that money? How could they do that? Very bright, capable people. Why? Because something is welled up in their heart that's above God, right? And that's called sin. This is what St. Augustine called, his definition of sin was disordered love, right? So, like, here's an example of disordered love. If I love my career, whatever it is, football, whatever, if I love my career more than my kids, that's disordered in terms of how God wants things. It's disordered. And so what happens when that gets disordered like that? What's going to happen to my kids? How are they going to feel? Neglected? Psychologically, psychologically they're going to develop, they're, they're going to be warped in their development psychologically because it's not how it's supposed to be because something is out of order. It's out of whack. And when something trumps God or goes above God, what do you think that does to you? It warps you psychologically. It warps you even more so spiritually. And so you get, you get off centered, you get off kilter, you get out of whack, um, out of alignment, out of, you're not justified, right? You're not where you should be. And everyone around you, and most notably yourself, you suffer for it, right? 
Because um, as a dad, if I'm not a good dad and I put my career over my kids, um, the kids are going to grow up warped. They're going to have to overcompensate, right? Because they didn't receive proper uh, love and care from me. Now they have to overcompensate and try and find that proper love and care in other places, right? Because there's a hole in the heart from it now because they're warped and it's not their fault. Um, you'll see this, well, I didn't have, my parents didn't love me enough, so now you want to go bounce from sexual relationship to sexual relationship to sexual relationship. And it's, it's you're, you're, you're just, you're dancing to your sin at that point. You've been, you've been warped because you've been sinned against and now you've been, <laughs> it's like, this is why we call it generational sin. You've been thrust into sin because your, your parents were jacked up and they sinned against you and it warped you into a lifetime of sin. And so Martha questions God's goodness. And what is Jesus' advice to her? He says, hey, <laughs> you're worried and distracted by what? Many things. And then what does he say? But really, what? There's one thing. Look at all the stuff in this world you could get worried about. And what does Jesus say? And there's really just one thing that's necessary. And then he says, Mary has chosen that one thing. And it will not be taken away from her. The antidote, Jesus says, is the one thing, which is what? Sitting at his feet. There's your, there's your antidote. How much are you sitting at his feet? How much, you know... Are you with other Christians in worship, in prayer? This is why we want people in our church to get into prayer groups, to get into Bible study. We want you at the Lord's feet. You know, it's not, it's not just an opportunity to learn. She wasn't just learning here. What was she doing? Loving. It wasn't just learning. To be sure, she probably was learning. She was listening to him, but it was more so about loving him. Loving him who loved her first, you see? There, there, there's your antidote. Let's, um, let's hop to another passage really quick. We're almost out of time. Uh, verse 41, I have, uh, verse 41, it says, you are worried and upset about many things. I have a letter next to worried in verse 41 that wants to take me to Luke chapter 12. I don't even know what that is. Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 11 and 22. Let's look at 11. So Luke 11, let's draw a line from here to here. And you go Luke 11, 22. And what does Jesus say in verse 22? Therefore, I tell you, Jesus said to his disciples, do not worry about your life. What you, excuse me, go back to verse 11. I want 11. He says, let's begin in verse 8. I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry how you will defend, your, defend yourselves or what you will say. So what are we learning from this? Luke 11, 11. Yeah. Specifically about, specifically, correct, yeah, specifically when you're in a situation, you guys, look it, where you're in a position where it's the name of Jesus needs to be spoken, the name of Jesus needs to be uplifted, because he says when you're brought before rulers and synagogue leaders, where you're in, where you're before people of power, and, you know, if, if we had to go testify in front of Congress or if we had to go speak before the Supreme Court or, you know, you had to go talk to someone who, of, of, you know, high power and influence, gosh, you're nervous. You're, you're, you're scared, right? And Jesus is saying, don't worry when you're in the face of the rich and the powerful and those who are in authority. Why? He says, you confess my name and I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit, so it's like, look at, uh, don't be scared of the powerful. Because what does Jesus say? The Holy Spirit who lives inside of you is going to give you words. <laughs> and I've talked with so many Christians. Um, these guys could probably give you numerous stories about that where it's, you, you, you're in a position and it's, it's, it's tight, it's hot, it's pressure. 
And, and, and you'll say, a word comes out and you're like, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Have you ever had, like, where did that come from? I wasn't even thinking about that. You know, uh, bang, just, come, just comes out. Jesus says that's how it is with the, the Holy Spirit. He will, give, he will give you the words that you are to say. Let's see if we could grab one more, one more passage. Um, what does it say at the end of verse 12? 11? I have an I. Uh, and the I takes me. Let's go to Mark. Last passage. Guys, because could, we could do this till 2 in the morning with worry. And, and, and I mean 2 in the morning tomorrow. The next 2 in the morning. Friday, 2 in the morning. Um, Let's go to, uh, oh, chapter 4 is where he sent us. That day, verse 35, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also others in the boat with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him. Teacher, don't you care if we, if we drown? So now we're in, look, Mark. Circle that. We'll circle that. So we're in Mark 4, 35 to, to 41. Look at verse 38. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Oh, that sounds familiar, does it not? Hello, Martha. Didn't know you were in the boat with us too. Well, what's the, what's, what's the Scripture telling you? It's like, the, think of it this way. I'm not talking like demonic stuff or anything, but think of it, if it's, if it's experienced by two different groups of people and they say the same thing, that's called a spirit of worry because it's, it's obviously not unique to when Martha says it. It's not unique to when the disciples say it, and they're saying the same things under similar conditions. Not similar, but stressful. One's stressed because of the, the domicile. Another, another group is stressed because they're maybe staring death in the face. And they both experience the same thing, and they say the same thing. What is that telling you? That means there's a, there's a spirit that's not of us or of God that makes us experience these things the same exact way. This is why... <laughs> This is why many times psychologists can treat this stuff is because it's, it's a spirit that's the same from you to you to you to you to you. It's not unique. When you're in a situation of stress and worry, you think, nobody knows <laughs> the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. And see, that's what worry does is you also think, you tend to think of yourself as isolated and then you know, God doesn't know, God doesn't care, my friends don't care, my wife doesn't care, I'm all alone, what am I going to do? See what it does? It isolates you too in your sin. So now what are you doing? You're chasing yourself once again. And the disciples say the same thing to Jesus. Don't you care? This is the last passage we're going to look. They question his goodness again. Don't you care? No, 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 no. <laughs> Athena, no. They, they're saying that to Jesus uh, again. Don't you care? It's like my stupid kids. When, um, the, the, when, I, when Dad, can we buy a, a this and that? And my answer is almost, even before I gauge or weigh even the words that they speak to me, my, re, my knee-jerk re-answer is always no. Um, where Kim's more of like, well, we'll see. I'm like, no. Can we go to this? No. I don't even know what you're going to ask. No, no. I should have a stamp that just says no, 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 no. There's great power in no. And they have a pile of toys, and they say, Dad, can we go to Target, get a blah, blah, blah? And, I, and obviously I say, no. And they're like, you don't love us. And I'm like, I look in that toy room, and there's literally a Mount Everest pile of toys, and you're telling me we don't care. You know, you as parents know what you do for your kids and the sacrifices you have to make financially. I mean, your time, your, base, your life basically from birth until they're 18 is just... My life is gone. It's on hold. We don't get to do anything anymore, right? It's going to stop at 18 in my house. <laughs> Luke, you just turned 18. You've seen, this, uh, you've seen this passageway before, but let me reintroduce you to the door. Get out, right? 
I, no, I'm still going to love them, but they are going to go. Um, and that's, well, I've read psychological literature on this too. Do you know, before we finish up here, did you know, uh, they've, they, I've read a bunch of psychological literature on um, the roles of mom and dad, and both are absolutely, both are 100% necessary. Um, and, it, it, and the role of, of the mother figure typically is to, be an, is to be the nurturer. It was when I was growing up. I mean, I'm, I'm running to mama. I don't want the, the, the crazy ex-marine, a former marine around me at all. You know, um, and mom wasn't a pushover, but, you know, there was a softness there. You know, there was a, you know, whereas with dad, there's more of a, eesh, which is why we all cry at Bambi because he gets stuck with that male buck and his sweet, loving mom, you know. And the role of the mother is to nurture. I mean, that, that, that's not even, you can't even disagree with that psychologically. I mean, it's like, it's not even my opinion. The role of the... ...supposed to be there to protect and to nurture, which she needs to. Um, the role of the father is to, is to help him leave home, is to, is to push him out. Metaphorically speaking, leave home. You know what I mean? Go back. Get back up on the bike, right? Make it yourself. You don't have a maid. This isn't a restaurant. We don't have menus here. If you want cereal, get your lazy butt out earlier in the, your bed in the morning. Make it yourself, right? It's time for you to, you need to go to college. You need to get the room for yourself. Uh, you need to do your own laundry. You need to, and typically that's what the role, if you have just dad, you have Pharisees. It's just, it's too, it's too harsh. Just mom, it's too overly nurturing. That's why you need both those, both those there. Um, but they say, Jesus, we'll finish up here. Don't you care? Um, and he says, look at, look at what he says, look at what he says to him. Verse 39, he got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Um, this teaches us, look, storms, what's a storm in life? Gosh, death, divorce, divorce. I mean, those are, those two we just named, those are real storms. I mean, it's not, it's not a Pacific Northwest gentle rainfall. Those are, those are knock you out storms that you should be afraid of. And this was a knock you out storm that you should be afraid of, right? Because these were fishermen. Ask Wheeler. He was a fisherman for uh, you know, a dozen years or 10 years. If you have fishermen and they're scared that the boat is going to get swamp swamped and it's going to kill them and they've spent their whole life on the water, then it must be pretty doggone bad. I mean, he's probably been through some bad ones. I don't go on fishing vessels like he does. I go on aircraft carriers, <laughs> right? I want a 110,000 ton vehicle that's 1,100 feet long that... Even in the fiercest squall, just kind of goes like that and goes like that. I'm good. <laughs> and I get rocked to sleep in the middle of a typhoon. That's what I want. Um, storms are going to come, but what does this passage tell you? What does Jesus say? He says, he says, you have little faith, but in the original Greek, he says, where is it? What is he saying? Uh, storms are not incompatible with my love for you. Just because you're in a storm, it doesn't mean I don't love you. We tend to think that if we're in a storm, we question God's goodness. Worry does that, or we question his love. And Jesus says here, because you're in a storm, just because you're in a storm, it doesn't mean I don't love you. Where is your faith? He says, in other words, guys, when the storm hits, why aren't you getting out your faith and using it on the storm? Gosh, that's so good. Why aren't you? I know who my Savior is, and I know who's, I know who's in my boat with me. I know that. That's what Jesus is saying. Why aren't you using it? Why, why are you just rolling under the waves of, of the storm? Why? When you have what? The Lord of the storm in your boat, which is, I love this facet about this passage because it says, after Jesus calms the wind and the waves, it says they were terrified they were going to die during the storm. Terrified, right? Jesus calms the storm. And the Bible says they're even more scared. <laughs> After he, after he calms it. And they think, who the hell is in this boat with us that was strong? 
that was stronger than the strongest thing I've ever seen in my life, which was this typhoon. And all he had to do in the Greek, it's just, he just says, shut up. And it just goes, it said it went to a dead calm, not rolled to a calm, just went, <laughs> stopped. Who is this? That's the scariest, strongest thing I've ever seen. And the guy in the boat just took the scariest and strongest thing I've ever seen and just said, shut up. And it just goes, okay. That's freaky, right? Well, what does that say? Look who you got in your boat with you. <laughs> so I'll just say, look in your boat. You got Jesus in your boat with you. Okay, so check this out. We just did, th- we just did one, two, four passages. We could have done a lot more. But watch this now. Now watch. Let's say I put this away in my file. And let's say Dan goes through something that's difficult, some hardship. I pull out this file and I look at anxiety or worry and I say, remember, it's future oriented. Gosh, it's the future. God holds the future. And it makes me question whether God loves me, but I know God loves me because of what Christ has done for me. And it exposes, exposes my lack of trust when I don't trust him with my future. It exposes my lack of trust. And I'm even acting like people who don't even believe in God. And God already knows, and I need to seek him first and his kingdom and his righteousness first. That's what I need to do. And furthermore, what, look, at you could be distracted, worried, pulled apart, many things. And again, it gets you question God's goodness. And I know the antidote is I need to get at his feet. And I know I need to be at the feet and hear the voice of the one who call, who, who is, who's, the, who's the Lord of all. And even if when I'm around the rich and the powerful and I'm succumbing to peer pressure with my friends and I, I want to make friends, but I don't want to appear to be a Jesus pusher, you push Jesus and the Holy Spirit will give you the right words and fill you with all the hope you need. And when the storms in life start to smash you around and you start to question God's goodness again, I need to remember that going through storms is not incompatible with him loving me. As a matter of fact, he's the one who went into the ultimate storm to give me his love so that all I go through are little mini storms that are nothing in comparison to the storm that he underwent so that I will never be ultimately drowned by the storm. Look, and I need to just look who's already in my boat. I've been saved by Jesus. I'm in this boat that we call life. And I know that I have a living Lord who's in the boat with me, who's stronger than anything this doggone world or the hell can throw at me. That's just... Put it in your file. Pull it out. And then whenever this is happening, there you go. That's verse pooling. So... And that's what you do. You reflect on it. Like, and this isn't just uh, musings f- from me. This is straight from the Word. Right. Right? This isn't my opinion. This is straight from the Word of God. Look at this. And do you see how if you just stuck with this, you'd have a really profound passage. But it wouldn't be as profound as if you didn't add Luke 10, 30 to 42 and Luke 11, 11 and Mark chapter 4, verse 25 to 41, you, 35 to 40. You wouldn't have all of that stuff. So yeah, I got the gist of it here, but look at now I get another angle and another angle and another angle and another angle and see how the word of God could start to literally just start to poke on your heart in so many different ways. That's a verse pooling does. This one stri- strikes you right in the heart. This one's going to stick, strike you on the side of the heart. This one's going to strike you on the other side of the heart. This one's going to stick you from the back of the heart. And all those, pu- when you start to put those all together, you get a beautiful composite of what God thinks about worry and how he could take it away. The other one I was going to go to was 1 Peter, where G, the, Peter says, cast all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. That's what we'll conclude with. Quick story before we go. He says, sir. Oh, yeah. Correct. So good. So good. So good. That's even better. Use it for prayer. I was using it for preaching to yourself. Use it for that second arrow. Use it for prayer first. That's so good. That's better. You know, so that's how you spend time with him. Um, and that's, pow- that's, isn't this powerful stuff? And God, Look, we just did four passages. 
I told you the passages about worry might be in the 400s. I mean, we've literally just put your, the tip of your big toe into the water on this stuff. Isn't that wild? And we're stoked and we're hopeful from it. Imagine if you could, like Luther said, imagine the Bible is a tree with branches, uh, with a trunk and with branches and with twigs. He says, Christians should go and rattle every branch and every twig, right? I mean, it's God's word. It's there to nourish you. It's there to, there to sustain you, you know? <sighs> what story was I going to tell you? Dang, it was a good, it must not have been very good, so... Um, <laughs> Ferdy, we'll conclude with this. Here it is. Gerhard Ferdy, my teacher, always used to say, um, you guys have heard me say this before. He says, just remember, when you open up the Word, it's alive. So it's not just a dead book with information. And he'd say, uh, it should almost read, reader, beware, when you open it up. Because he said, the Bible's the only book that reads you back. Haven't you had that? When you start, look at when we started doing this, you're like, and we're, we're doing the interpreting here. We're reading and we're interpreting. And then you start getting 50 minutes into it. And you're like, holy crap, I'm getting interpreted. I'm getting read. That's how the word works because it's living and alive. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank you, Father, for your word. It's sufficient. Lord, teach us uh, to pray aright. Teach us to get our eyes fixed on you, never to question your goodness. Let us not worry about the future, but just let us cling to Jesus who's already secured the future. Lord, as we, as we know our, from Jesus, our past is redeemed. Hmm? Our present makes sense. Our future is secure because of him. If it was up to us by our self-justification and our worries, our future is not secure. Our past is insane and our present doesn't make any sense. But because Jesus, you died and rose again and you are our righteousness, our future is locked tight, safe in your arms. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're not here next uh, Tuesday. Mm -mm. But the following Tuesday, we will be for our last one.